Hello, friends, and welcome to the Particularly Peculiar podcast. We are in season two, episode four. In today's episode, I will be covering the mysterious case of Phineas Gage. I'm your host, Taylor. In this podcast, we delve into all that is mysterious, bizarre, and peculiar. Thank you for joining me. To our repeat listeners, welcome, peculiar people. And to those listening for the first time, the peculiar people, welcome you. As a lover of psychology, I have definitely heard about Phineas Gage, or as they have called him, the man who began neuroscience. And I had heard about this case before, but even if I was not a psych nerd or someone who studied psychology, I would likely have heard about it anyway. And I think many people have heard his tale, but I am excited to go over it today. I am utilizing sources from verywellmind.com, thesmithsonianmagazine.com, and britannica.com. Phineas Gage was born July of 1823. He was born to farmers in New Hampshire, and not much more is known about his early life other than that he worked on the family farm, and then he eventually moved on to work on construction with the railroad. The day is September 13th, 1848. Phineas is a young 25 years old. However, he was the foreman of his crew. They were working in Cavendish, Vermont at the time. Gage was tasked with clearing rock from the ground where the rails were to be laid. First, they drill a hole in the rock. Then the hole is filled with gunpowder and a fuse is set. Sand would typically be placed on top of the gunpowder to prevent contact and then the tamping rods would be used to set explosive into the rock. So for reference, those tamping rods are three and a half feet long, roughly, one and a quarter inches in diameter, and weigh a little over 13 pounds. On this day, Gage was going about his usual business, and he had just gotten to the part where he would tamp down some gunpowder into the rock, although it is said that he did skip the step of adding the sand. And as Gage was working... The gunpowder detonated. It literally rocketed the tamping iron out of the hole. This giant rod struck him in his left cheek, tore through the top of his skull, completely obliterating his frontal lobe, exited his skull, and propelled behind him to land about 80 feet behind where Phineas was standing. 80 feet. This had some serious force. And sometimes I wonder if how fast it happened was what caused him to survive. And not only did Phineas survive, but he remained conscious through the whole ordeal. He was able to speak and walk. He actually walked himself to the cart for transport. And he was recalled even having a little bit of spunk when he spoke with the doctors treating him. He said, here's enough business for you. He was aware enough that he could recall the day and who his crew was at the time of the accident, and he didn't want to bother with visitors because he figured he'd just be right back to work. Although Gage seemed great initially after the incident, he went on to develop an infection. About 10 days after his accident, he was nearly unresponsive, and he seemed close to death. Phineas was in a semi-comatose state from September 23rd to October 3rd. Eventually, he was conscious but bedridden until October 7th, when he was able to walk again. And by October 11th, his overall intellect and intelligent function was improving from his coma. And within a month, he was well enough to even leave the house. Dr. John Martin Harlow is who was caring for Phineas at this time. And the majority of what is known about the case comes directly from Dr. Harlow. So what were the effects of this accident that Gage suffered? He showed no motor or speech impairments, and physically, he was able to work again within only a couple of months. Before the accident, Phineas was known as pleasant, hardworking, motivated, and energetic. But after the accident, he was clearly a changed man. Harlow had noted that Gage's friends considered him, quote, no longer Gage, quote. He could not stick to plans. He spewed profanities when Gage, before the incident, would never speak that way. And he also showed very little care or respect for his friends, which was extremely unusual for him. He began to act in ways that would be considered inappropriate. It was said to be so bad that the railroad company he worked for before his accident, who thought he was a wonderful foreman, wouldn't even take him back. He was so unlike himself. He was said to be restless, rude, and unreliable. 
Gage eventually went on to work at a stable in New Hampshire. He drove coaches in Chile, and eventually he moved to San Francisco to live with relatives. Intelligence-wise, he was fine with time and memory, but he did have a hard time estimating size or money. When Harlow saw Gage a year later after the accident, the doctor noted that while Gage had lost vision in his right eye and was left with obvious scars from the accident, he was otherwise in good physical health and appeared recovered. Phineas Gage died in May 1860 at the age of 36 after a series of seizures. His skull and his iron tamping rod were put on permanent exhibit at Harvard Medical School's Warren Anatomical Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. According to Very Well Mind, in a 1994 study, researchers utilized neuroimaging techniques to reconstruct Phineas Gage's skull and determine the exact placement of the injury. Their findings indicate that he suffered injuries to both the left and right prefrontal cortex, which would result in problems with emotional processing and rational decision making. Another study conducted in 2004 used three dimensional computer aided reconstruction to analyze the extent of Gage's injury, and it found that the effects were limited to the left frontal lobe. Theories about Gage's survival and recovery comes from verywellmind.com, and I am pretty much going to read from their website at this point just to go over all their theories. The type of injury sustained by Phineas Gage could have easily been fatal. While it cannot be said with certainty why Gage was able to survive the accident, let alone recover from the injury and still function. Several theories exist. They include, number one, the rod's path. Some researchers suggest that the rod's path likely played a role in Gage's survival in that if it had penetrated other areas of his head, such as the pterygoid plexus or the cavernous sinus, Gage may have bled to death. In a 2022 study of another individual who also had an iron rod go through his skull, whom researchers referred to as modern-day Phineas Gage, it was found that the brain can selectively recruit non-injured areas to help perform functions previously assigned to the injured portion. I wonder if that would be because of the neurons in the brain. So, like, of course, the neurons and synapses are all connected to help the brain work together. So I wonder if they could just somehow create that bridge from different areas of the brain to help out with that. That's super interesting. Others theorize that Gage's work provided him structure, positively contributing to his recovery and aiding in his rehabilitation. So why was Gage's case so amazing, and why do we still talk about it today? It's because his case was the first to suggest a link between brain trauma and personality change. Gage's case influenced neurology heavily. The specific changes observed in his behavior brought about theories about the localization of brain function, or the idea that certain functions are associated with specific areas of the brain. Of course, at the time, neurology was a very new study. And, quote, Gage's extraordinary story served as one of the first sources of evidence that the frontal lobe was involved in personality. Today, scientists better understand the role that the frontal cortex must play in important higher order function, such as reasoning, language, and social cognition. Another interesting fact about the case is the photo that we now know to be Phineas Gage at first was unknown. It was thought that the man in the photo had a harpooning accident. However, Michael Spurlock, a database administrator in Missoula, Montana, saw the picture and the item that would have injured Phineas and knew it was a match. Apparently in this picture, uh, I will post it to our socials, but it is a man holding a tamping iron. And I believe it even has an inscription on it that says, this is the bar that was shot through the head of Mr. Phineas P. Gage. So Harvard has not officially declared that this picture is of Gage, but those who studied Gage's case uh, are quite certain that it is a picture of him. So it's just really interesting. I just really love uh, this case, looking at how he was affected. Um, I used to work in a neurology office, and we very much saw these big shifts in personality when someone had a traumatic brain injury. At the time, I was very young, and I wasn't really looking into how 
traumatic brain injury would affect someone neurologically. I just worked in the office and I knew it. Um, I mean, I knew about the cases that we knew about. I wish that while I was there, I would have taken advantage of, you know, the learning opportunity that it was and actually learned a bit more about it. But I will say that it was extremely interesting to see people with traumatic brain injury You know, of course, we didn't really know them before their traumatic brain injury, but when their families would come along and share with us, uh, it it's very sad. It's uh, you know, it's sad to to see how much someone can change just from an accident. Even you know, it's so sad and it's just amazing to me. But the brain is a magnificent thing, and the fact that people can survive these traumatic brain injuries and still function in any way is pretty amazing. So I did want to look into the modern day Phineas Gage a little bit more. Phineas Gage was working with the railroad. He was from the 19th century, um, 1800s. But the modern day Phineas Gage is a 24-year-old Brazilian construction worker named Eduardo. So what happened was Eduardo was working down below when a six-foot pole fell from fifth floor of a building that he was working on. It pierced his hard hat, entered the back of his skull, and exited between his eyes. So it was almost like the reverse of Phineas's accident. Although it says that it did go through his frontal lobe, the head of neurosurgery at the Rio de Janeiro Hospital, Louise Essinger, said that it pierced a, quote, non-eloquent region of his brain, an area that has no easily discernible cognitive, motor, or sensory function says that he had very little personality change, but they're wondering if the fact that he doesn't seem at all bothered by his accident could be an effect of the frontal lesion. Unfortunately, they can't tell if any major changes occurred until they can do a deeper uh, brain scans and things like that. And just with Phineas Gage, it wasn't apparent immediately that he had personality changes, so it could come to be apparent later on down the line. But I just find it really interesting uh, that basically the same thing happened (laughs) to someone else. Like, I think this was just roughly 2012. I mean, it's so scary that things like that continue to happen. We can't be protected from all accidents all the time, right? Of course not. It does give us some hope that we can go through these things and live to tail the tale and live normal lives. Okay, you guys, I know today's episode is a super short episode. Um, I hope you all are okay with that. (laughs) Um, I'm glad to just be back and be here recording for you guys and getting content out to you guys. Um, But I do want to ask, do you guys like these shorter um, information packed episodes or do you like a little bit longer? Um, I do want to know if you're really liking these informative ones. Um, where there's a little bit of history and things like that, a little bit of science, or if you're more interested in things like paranormal, true crime, mysteries, unsolved cases. I really just want to know what you guys think, um, what you're liking and not liking currently about the show. Again, I hope to have Christian on with me sometime soon. We can record another episode together and uh, do something for you guys together. Um, Don't know when that will happen, but I hope it is soon. So um, yeah, just let me know. Um, I would love to interact with you guys and just see how everyone's liking it. Remember to like, rate, review, subscribe, comment, whatever it is you can do on whichever platform you use. Please visit our website at particularlypeculiar.com. You can find all of our socials. We are on TikTok. We are on Instagram. There's also a link to our store and a contact form where you can send us a message. You can send us a message with ideas for an episode, a peculiar story of your own, or again, just to say hey and let me know how you're liking the show. You will also find a donation tab there as well if you'd like to help us out. That is all we have for you today. We will see you again soon. Until next time, our peculiar people.